We're very pleased to have Eldar Shafir and Sendhil Mulanathan with us to speak next. Uh, Sendhil is a professor of economics at Harvard. Uh, both of them have very lengthy lists of accomplishments, which you can read about in the program, so I won't go through that. The one thing I will uh, mention is they have a book coming out that covers a lot of the themes that they'll discuss today. Uh, it is much as Neighborhood Trust is the organization formerly known as Credit Where Credit Is Due. Their book is the book formerly known as The Packing Problem. Unfortunately, they don't yet have a new title for it. Uh, so apparently it's coming out sometime next year. Uh, so I'll turn it over now to Sendel. Try to take this. Okay, let me, um, let me start with... Um, most of what Eldar is going to present is um, uh, is going to be directly related to the book. I wanted to take a few minutes to do something else. I wanted to talk a little bit about behavioral economics and applying behavioral economics because I think that in the last five years, my my thinking, Eldar saying a lot of our thinking has really been evolving in how to use behavioral economics. And so I'm just going to take about 15 minutes, 10 minutes, to tell you a little bit about the evolution of that thinking and uh, where that's headed. Um, and one place it's headed is to rethinking what it means to be poor. Uh, but there was another strand which I wanted to fill you in so you understood. So first, what is behavioral economics? And I think it's somewhere between here and here. Um, it's neither of these, and I think people will often try and uh, play one of these up uh, we're not saying people are like Homer Simpson. I mean, Homer Simpson's a smart guy, but most people are smarter than him. Uh, nor are we saying that there's some science out there. You put people in the scanners. We can read people's minds. We know everything. We can control you. In fact, I know exactly why you're doing what you're doing right now. Uh, it's neither of these extremes. Behavioral economics is somewhere in between. This is a photo I often use to explain exactly where in between it is. It's the complexity of human behavior as it appears in the world. You can see it here. <laughs> and this complexity is reflected in the fact that we as people are not particularly consistent. Uh, just like these gentlemen, uh, do they want to go to the gym and get a workout? Yeah. Do they want to get a workout? No. And so you can see that here. And that's sort of the fundamental challenge behavioral economics poses for us. Here's a little bit of a way to think of that challenge. <clears throat> If you, uh, I guess if I move over here, you can't hear me in the back, right? I could be like this. Yeah, I could do this, but then I'll feel like a professional singer. And <laughs> I'd have to get rid of my last name and go with one name. Maybe I'll do that. Um, here's what I think of as a challenge of behavioral economics, but in a totally different context. So you guys can see this from the back. This is a pencil. It's located inside a piece of wood. Okay? And you'll notice the wood has holes drilled in it, and the pencil is in there. And the pencil can move around. Now, I haven't brought a physical one with me, but if I had, you'd see that there's nothing here on this side, there's nothing here on this side. This is one solid piece of wood. It's never been broken down. It's never been cut in half. Nor has the pencil been cut in half. How did we get the pencil into this wood? Any guesses? Magic. Oh. Well, since my time is short, I'll give it. Ah, well, that, we also cheat, but not in this case. No, this is a real physical object. The answer goes back to something fundamental about the use of behavioral economics. Most of the mistakes we make in the programs we design, whether they're about helping uh, um, people on probation not fall back into crime, or whether they're about financial design, which you saw today, they come from the fact that we have an implicit assumption about the problem that we're facing. And that assumption drives the solutions we seek or the questions we ask. You have an implicit assumption here about wood, that it is a solid object. But in fact, if I told you, think about a sponge, all of a sudden you'd realize you know wood is not solid. If you make wood wet, it becomes very bendable. And that's all we did. We wet the wood, we bend it, we put the pencil in. That's a metaphor that I keep in the back of my mind because the assumptions we make about the problem can lead us to uh, not see important solutions. 
And to me, that's the core of behavioral economics as it's applied, is that we make assumptions about people all the time without realizing it. We make assumptions about the people we serve. We make assumptions about the people who work with us. We make lots of assumptions, and many of those assumptions are wrong. And because people operate differently than we think, because we operate differently than we think, the solutions we seek are very different. The first one of these that really, I think, opened my eyes and most everyone's eyes as to the power of this, that this is not some abstract notion but that it's an incredibly powerful one, is this example with 401ks. Have you all seen this? Okay, for those of you who haven't, we had a problem. People weren't participating in 401ks. And people did a little experiment with the firm. They said, you know, the way you participate in a 401k is you go in, first day of work, someone gives you a form and says, here, fill out this form if you want to participate. So here, if you want to enroll, check this box and put your deduction amount here. They did an experiment. They took some of the employees and they said, let's change this. If you don't want to enroll, check this box. If you want to change in deduction, check this box. This is a trick. Here's why it's interesting. Not because it's a trick, not because it's clever, but because of what happened. Here is 48 months after hire, the percentage of people who are participating in 401ks. This is four years later. This is all that changed. For those who had this pot opt in, that you had to do something, 55% were participating. For those who had to do something to not participate, 85%. Now, I think in this space, so in the social space, lots of big numbers are thrown around. I can honestly tell you, savings, retirement savings, has been studied endlessly. There is not a single economist who would have said, even with the biggest subsidy, with the biggest match that's feasible, I can increase savings by 30 percentage points. That is insanely large. And to me, that's what got me interested in using behavioral economics. We've been thinking about this problem incorrectly. We kept pulling a particular lever. Let's keep raising subsidies. Let's teach people. Let's give some. And, you know, maybe we had some effects. But no effect. Nobody was claiming they're going to get stuff 30 percentage points, 3 in 10. And these are not small studies. It's not a one-off study. People have done other studies like this and found similar strong effects. And in fact, this led to the Pension Reform Act. Okay, this leads to the next part of the story. When I tell the story like this and you get excited, and when we started working on this, you think the world is going to be like this. You're going to throw a bunch of darts and you're just going to hit it. It turns out some days felt like this, Probably more accurately, it's a little closer to this. What I mean by that is, take the default. You see the story with defaults in 401ks, and you say, hey, I'm going to use this everywhere. I can think of lots of programs where we put defaults in. But guess what? In lots of places, defaults don't do anything. Think of how many times when you rent a car, you go and you X the box in 14 places. You're overriding defaults. Somebody put in some consumer protection so that you're aware that the default is being over. You just, I, don't, I have no idea what that stuff says. I've rented hundreds of cars. I have no idea where I'm putting X's and why I'm putting it there. There isn't a magic bullet, and you can't just take it and throw darts and hit it correctly. That's when I realized there's a more basic problem, and this is the problem that we kind of encounter in all of this work. Behavioral economics is sort of designed, but this is a picture of Eldar um, when he's working. <laughs> This is what behavioral economics has been like. It's a lab science. In the lab, we have tremendous control. We can find effects. The effects can be big. When we take them to the world, the world is much more complicated. Figuring out what works is hard. It's not, this science is not built for that. We need something else. What we need is a science in its own right, much like engineering is to physics, but something that is not about the lab, something that's not, the tools are not about microscopes, but the tools are things that allow us to look into the world and be able to take the problems we face and in a more analytical way, come up with solutions. And just like engineering, the problems we face are totally different. In the lab, you can come up with all sorts of nifty little solutions. In the world, you have to worry about the pragmatic details of how will this scale? So I'll give you an example. When they tried defaults with trying to get people to save at tax time Vita sites, well, the default is very hard to implement at that point. There's no automatic deduction. There's nothing. You have to sort of train 
volunteer workers at Vita sites about the default. Try, imagine trying to do that at scale. You have volunteers coming in. It's already hard enough to train them on the nuances of getting the tax time accounts working well. Now you have to add a module, which is very subtle. Make the default this, say it to people this way. If they say this, don't say, it's just hard to scale. So there's sort of two problems we we're facing. One problem is that we needed tools, but we also needed tools that would effectively scale. So what I want to tell you is that's what we've been doing for the last, I don't know, how many, how long, long time? All right, Elder, don't, don't make it sound like a, too long a time. Let's say three years. That feels better than 10. The numbers you're throwing out are scary. Um, and I think what we have is we have a tool. And that tool is still in progress. It's 1.0, and it's called behavioral mapping. And it is a scientific tool. It's not a tool where we just take ideas and we simply throw them at a wall and hope the darts fit. It's a way for us to take a problem, analyze it using behavioral science and using this behavioral mapping tool, identify what are the behavioral bottlenecks, the bottlenecks that are causing this that are not the bottlenecks you might otherwise think of, and then use that tool to come up with the nudge like the default, or it's a whole new invention. I'll walk you through a few examples of this. The first example, let's go back to the defaults in 401ks. We started with saving too little. <laughs> Where most of the... Oh, you know, we should invent something like this, but that you don't have to hold. Will, can you write this down? I think we can make a lot of money if we went one. Does it, exist? <laughs> it, does it exist? You think so? Yeah. Yeah, not, maybe. Let's, you guys are all so negative. We start with save too little. Normally, what ends up happening is, implicitly because we have the wrong model, we identify a different bottleneck. People don't want to save. People don't find it valuable enough to save. People don't understand the benefits of saving. People don't um, have the money to save. That's the bottleneck we normally get sidetracked, and that's what happens with 401ks. Here, you apply this tool, and you end up with something fairly banal. And you find this in the data. When you look at it, people intend to save. But guess what? They forget. You want to fill out your 401k form, participation form, but it's a nice weekend. I'll do it next weekend. You procrastinate. Two weekends pass like this, and then you're like, okay, this weekend it's raining, I'm going to do it. And you're like, shit, I don't know where the form is. Ah, oh, forget, I got other stuff to do. There's CV on, Glee is on, whatever that is. <laughs> I don't know what that is. But the point is, you identify the bottleneck, and then... That leads, by you understanding that bottleneck, to a set of solutions, in this case, the default. Let me just show you a few other examples like this. By using this tool, we've had, we've had the good fortune of working with a bunch of sites now. In one site, we had the following problem. Many of you know what welfare-to-work programs are like, so this is a welfare-to-work program. And as in many welfare-to-work programs, that there's TANF recipients there who they're trying to encourage to go look for a job. And the problem they had was their recipients were not looking for a job. They were not searching for work. Realistically, almost nobody was leaving. Next, I'm going to show you a really elegant, beautifully drawn graph. So I want you to appreciate its minimalist simplicity. I did not make this graph. The point is, this is the outcome of a huge behavioral mapping exercise. But I want to just walk you through, not at big level, but just walk you through what happens. Here's a client. They go through this whole process. Then they get assigned to uh, the human services. They get client orientation intake. And then they get divided into two groups. This is a welfare to work program. There'll be some clients who are easy to place. And then they, they're told to go on job interview. There's some clients that are hard to place. And then they work with job developers. They prepare sales resumes. This is where all the problem is coming in. Okay? The hard to place clients, as you might imagine. Okay. So what's the problem? Let me skip this part. Here's the problem. When, here's the bottleneck. When the client is put here, they're told, you're job ready. When the client is put here, they're told, oh, you're not job ready. Now, that's a small thing. That's just an internal categorization that they have, job ready, not job ready. But to the client, it can be very, very big. Let me tell you an important psychology, and that's what we would argue is the big bottleneck in this program, or at least one big bottleneck. There's something called identity threat. Many of you may know this, but these are some very profound experiments. <clears throat> if you um, take an African-American child and you give them a math exam, and before the math exam, you either do nothing, you just say, here's a math exam, 
Or before the math exam, you ask them, what race are you? That's it, small change. What you find is asking, these are white subjects and these are black subjects. If you don't ask what race they are, African American students do similarly to white students on this math exam. And you can do this with SAT, you can do this with many things. Ask them their race, and all of a sudden they do much, much worse. What's going on? Well, there's a lot of interesting psychology. I'm not going to get too deep into it. Eldar will get into some of the related psychology. But at a first blush, the race prime is reminding them of an identity they have. They're African American. And that identity is supposed to be one where they're bad at math. There's a threat here. This test is a threat. And what we know is people have multiple identities about themselves. If you make a particular identity salient, they'll behave in the context of that identity. You go into a welfare office, you're not sure about yourself, but a part of what you're worried about is you've been on welfare for many years, is that you're not job ready. Guess what they just told you? You're not job ready. Great. So... The solution to this, oh, sorry, I missed the slide. So it turns out, and this is what we're trying now, it turns out that this is, if, if you decide this is the bottleneck, you might be able to get a very big bang for your buck by simply going back to the program and at its core changing all the framing of the messages as to why the people who ended up here ended up here. And this has actually been done, for example, in Michigan for African-American students who enter this, uh, who enter who are normally coming in with lower, um, back, poorer backgrounds, reframing that entire program from a remedial program to not being remedial, but we're providing you help because you've shown such great success in reaching this point, has had a big impact on how those students do at Michigan. Similarly here, the very framing of this program from not job ready, this group, could have a big effect. I'll give you another example. As you may know, uh, this is a totally different problem. Uh, probation in New York City and in many uh, places, and this is where we're, we're working on this in New York City, is, remains almost a gateway to jail. What I mean by that is that many people who end up on probation, despite the best efforts of probation departments, you're pretty sure where they're going to end up, have a pretty high probability where they're going to end up. So we went and did a behavioral mapping. And here's one bottleneck that we noticed that was very helpful. If you view crime through the lens of this is something people want to do, well, it's a pretty hard problem to stop. If you view le- a crime through the same problem, say, that Dean put forward earlier as a self-control problem or as a problem where you get caught up in the moment, then what you'd start looking for is what are the moments of temptation? If you have a friend who's trying to diet you would know, and, they, and they came with you to this conference, you would know whenever they walk by that table, that's the problem point. And if you can keep them from walking by that table or protect them when they walk by that table, you'd be okay. Crime is not that different. Crimes don't happen all the time and in all places. Even for this population. Take This is even murder. Crimes happen around this period. They happen around 7 p.m., 6 p.m., till about 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And it's not just every day. They happen Friday night, Saturday night, and some of Sunday night. So really, we're not talking, and they don't happen everywhere, They happen in specific locations. So we're not talking about temptation points that are obtuse and everywhere. We're talking about focused moments of temptation, focused moments of risk, focused times, and focused places. So this is something that we're, I think we'll be piloting. So the idea is, if that's the case, then why don't we target using GPS devices, which we now have, and whether that's done as a phone or whether that's done as an ankle bracelet. Part of probation for especially the violent offenders, need not be something that is so um, so revolving around, oh, let's talk to them, give them job opportunities. Part of it can also be using sanctions that are very different. For example, this is what I'm saying with the electronic monitors. If you violate certain things, like you didn't show up for your job search thing, one sanction we can put is to protect you from those moments and those times. We can say, hey, we're going to put a curfew You're free to do whatever you want, but for those moments, Friday night, 8 p.m. to 2 a.m., you have to be at home or you have to avoid these hotspots. That doesn't just need to be punitive. They can be positive. For example, if if this is not given through an ankle bracelet but is given through a phone, 
nor does it need to be to keep you away from the bad spots. It can be to keep you to the good spots. So instead of saying we want you to show up at school, we know whether you showed up at school because we know whether your phone showed up at school. And we can change the sanctions and we can change the car- carrots and the sticks as you go. Okay, so let me move on to the next one. We call this climb. So what I want to say here is we've got this tool and I think we're using it in a few places and I thought this group is a great group because I imagine some of you might have some problems um, in your programs, uh, maybe. And if you do, we also are looking for problems and so there might be an interesting match. And the nonprofit Elder and I have set up um, is exactly aimed at using these tools to find solutions. Okay, let me tell you the last problem, which is a lead, w- lead into Eldar's issue, which is one of the problems we struggled with very early on, is if you look at low-income workers, they are less productive. They have higher turnover. It is one of the biggest problems that employers have in hiring low-income workers, is that they, you can just see it in the raw data. They're going to turn over more often. They're going to be less productive when they're there. And the biggest complaint that employers have is, what do we do about this productivity? So when we went and used this behavioral mapping tool, what we realized was the problem is much deeper than this. There's something going on. All the standard psychology we were using wasn't really working, and what we needed here was not engineering, but we needed Eldar to like really have a big discovery, and as a scientific discovery. So what Eldar is going to talk a little bit about is going back to a problem like this that we began with, but which really changed our perspective of poverty broadly. Is that fair to say, Eldar? Do you want to use this? Yes. Okay. Uh, pleasure to be here. I'll try to pick up where Sendel left. So, uh, in our lives as researchers, there's often a, a tension between how you devalue time between research of the kind that can be published and that your colleagues want you to do and applied work in the field, often not built in order to discover new things, but actually to apply what you already know and, and help uh, people, hopefully. That tension is, is pretty powerful in the lives of, of many of us. Uh, but the dream, the, the wonderful moment happens when you can combine the two, when you do applied attempts to implement your knowledge in the field and discover new things while doing that. And I think we've been really lucky this way in the last few years, which is what's uh, leading to the book that Ray mentioned. And so what I want to do is uh, discuss to you briefly what happened to us, how we try to implement some of the uh, perspectives that Senel just described, and how we seem to have discovered something we didn't know before that we think might be important and I want to share with you briefly. It's work done with uh, colleagues and students and graduate students, etc. We entered this really uh, very naively. We said, look, we would like to study how to think about decision making in context of poverty. Um, There are two schools when you look in literature, mostly at the time done by sociologists and economists and others. Literature basically had two views. One said the poor are perfectly rational, like everybody else, according to standard economic thinking. They maximize their circumstances. They do the best they can. The other view talked about culture of poverty, pathology, myopia, and all that. And we came and said, look, we have something new to sell. We think people are not perfectly rational. Nobody in this room is described well by the rational model. What if we think about the poor that way? As just you know, regular human creatures who are prone to occasional errors and lapses of attention. And what if we think about it that way? Can we do things that are interesting? And that's what we were doing for a while. And we're doing some nice work trying to increase take up of, of bank accounts and doing other things like that. But then we came across issues, cases that look different, where there appeared to be behavioral issues problems in context of poverty that didn't quite mimic what we tend to see among uh, the populations we know better. And so that led us to work over the last few years, which is where we are today, where we talk about the psychology of scarcity. The feeling was that being under conditions of scarcity produces its own psychology. And then that psychology, when you put it in the context of poverty, leads to to the phenomena that we we all have come to know and and worry about. So that's sort of the, the perspective we took. Um, we use, uh, Ray's reference to the, the packing problem, we use a suitcase metaphor, which is not central anymore, which is why the title is going to change, but it is still helpful. The idea is we think about a person, person's budget as a suitcase. Some of us have larger suitcases and some of us have smaller ones. Typically, the large ones have more slack in them. The smaller ones are very tightly packed, and that has a lot of implications. If we go down the street and I see a pair of shoes I like, I ask, is the price right? And if it is, I toss them in my suitcase. When you, with a very tight suitcase, 
see the pair of shoes, you ask, is the price right? And what do I take out of my suitcase to make, make room for these shoes? You enter trade-off thinking. And the argument, at least uh, part of what we argue in the book and for which I'll show you some data, is interestingly enough, for most small expenses, you know, books and lunches and coffees with friends, you don't ask yourself, what will I not buy instead if I do this? It's as if you're reaching into an infinite bucket of small expenses. The poor person might ask himself, what do I not do instead anytime she buys anything above a muffin? And the argument is that that life, that life where you need to carefully pack and do the trade-offs and think about it all the time is tougher, computationally more difficult to fit it all in, requires a lot more attention, and is going to be error-prone. And so that's some of the issues that arise. And so notice the implications are pretty clear. If I'm, t if I'm packing very tightly and it's hard for me to do, I'm going to care a lot about the exact size of items. You don't really care exactly w which sweater is bigger because you have room in your suitcase. I know exactly. I'm going to think about trade-offs a lot more. So if you ask people, this is uh, in the US, uh, this is in India, if you simply free, free thinking ask them, what do you think about when you buy things, you get a lot more frequency of mention of what will I not buy instead among the poor than among the rich, as, as you'd predict. Uh, and also in terms of price knowledge. So we, I'm very proud of this one. It took us a while to find. We went to a uh, South Station in Boston and asked people, for their household income, and when you come out of the station and take a cab, what does the meter read in the cab when you get in? Now, I'm proud of it is because that's one case where nobody would argue that the poor take taxis more than the rich. Nonetheless, they're three times more likely to know the answer. We pack carelessly. When I go into the cab, I really don't care if it's 270 or 240 or 310. The poor, and we know this, for example, from Kathy Eden's work uh, among food recipients, calculate exactly how much will I save if I go buy my groceries and Boston rather than Roxbury, and how much will the cab cost uh, as a re uh, instead? So those are the, the careful packing issues that arise that we know, and they have enormous implications for how much time you need to spend, how much focusing you do, and what that costs you instead, and I'll get to that in a minute. One uh, footnote, part of our discovery here, and it will be a theme in the book, is that scarcity doesn't have to be monetary poverty. So one of the arguments is going to be, is that many of you are time poor in ways that are not dissimilar from the way our subjects are money poor. When I ask a good friend of mine who works very hard, he paints homes, works very hard, five o'clock he's free until the next day. I ask him, do you want to go to the movies? He says, do I want to see this movie? And if yes, why not? If I ask Ray, do you want to go to the movies? He says, do I want to see the movie? And what do I not do tonight? That I was going to do tonight, I'm going to have to do tomorrow. He's in trade-off packing mode full time. And that has enormous implications. And so, um, some of the implications are you're going to think of trade-offs when you're packing your time tightly, very similar to the way the person does when they pack their money. Basic stuff becomes luxuries. For the poor person, stuff that you take for granted as a basically, well, comfortable American become a luxury to the person who cannot afford them. And similarly for time. You would think a basic happy American spends an hour with their children every night without any trouble. Many of us, when we spend that hour, feel like we should be doing something else. It's turned into a luxury. Um, this one I love. There's a lot of critique about the poor who have debts they cannot pay. Nonetheless, they you know, buy their kids' shoes. If they can't afford their debts, what are they doing buying small luxuries? And what I say to you here is, how many of you are sitting on temporal deadlines that you will never be able to respect? And if so, what are you doing schmoozing here with me? <laughs> you should be going back and doing those an extra five minutes at a time. And you can see the psychology. It doesn't feel the same. Those small things don't add up to the big one. I need those... Etc. Anyway, so that's part of the bigger story. And all of this, apropos, I want to focus it today. Obviously, it's very consequential. The mistakes we make, which are shared by all, cost me a lot more when I'm poor than when I'm rich uh, and all that. So that has led us to the psychology of scarcity. Is this working? Um, and I'll just give you a very brief outline of the kind of things we, we investigate and, and report in our, in our work that basically suggests that when you're packing tightly and you're having a hard time, you focus heavily on the task at hand. While you're focusing heavily on the task at hand, you end up tunneling. You focus on it so much that other stuff gets neglected. That's, among other things, going to lead to borrowing because borrowing solves the momentary stressful problem at the expense of things that are less than your focus and other issues that arise out of this life of focusing very hardly on the scarcity at hand and leaving other things uh, more fuzzy for later. Um, the nice advantage we have is because, is because our story is not only about money, we can also look at time. So one thing we can do is, for example, run regular folks on time as opposed to money. We had a big plan to try to take uh, 100 Princeton 
graduates and land them for a few months in some deserted place with other mommy's credit card and see how they act when they're poor. But this is not simple to do, so we did something simpler. <laughs> we did something simpler, we took them to the lab, and we had them play a game. In this case, it's Family Feud. Uh, they're going to play the game, multiple rounds, four points, which get translated to money, so the better you do, the more you get paid. But what we're going to do here is going to make some of them rich and some of them poor. The rich have more time per round, the poor have much less. In addition, crossed with that, it's a two-by-two two design, some of the rich cannot borrow, so every round when it ends, you start the next one, and some can borrow. If you would like, you can take an extra few seconds now and have fewer seconds left at the end. You borrow at high interest, so every second you take, you have two seconds less at the end of the game. And same for the poor. Now, uh, they play this game. We look at how they do, and here is what you get. Um, if you simply look at how many rounds are completed and how many points are earned, the rich do better than the poor. So that's not surprising. These are the rich, these are the poor. They do a bit better because they're richer. Now let's let them borrow. These are the non-borrowing conditions. When I let you borrow at high interest rate, not terribly tempting uh, loans, the rich are very careful. They're diligent. They're, they, they distinguish carefully when it's worth and when it's not. They do a tiny bit better. Basically, there's no difference when they can borrow and they can't. The poor, who are under enormous stress and need a few extra seconds because they're running out, borrow a lot more, complete many fewer rounds, and get much less money. Now, let me remind you, the poor here are sophisticated Princeton undergraduates. And so what's exciting to us, at least in this case, is you're replicating basically high interest borrowing, predatory lending, in a lab with Princeton students that's very similar in structure to what you get in, among the poor in Trenton, 12 miles away, and that we tend to think comes from lack of education, lack of understanding, myopia, et cetera, doesn't seem to be true here. These are not the students you characterize that way, and we know they're not that way, because if you give them a little bit more time, they seem to act quite reasonably. Um, we have done a number of studies like these. Uh, another one has to do with debt traps, another one has to do with uh, smoothing consumption over time. In all of these cases, these are normalized, the rich, when you let them borrow, their, in, their, their performance is not impacted much. The poor, the Princeton students who don't have enough time, get focused on the problem at hand, feel like they need a few more seconds, or use too many seconds at the present and don't smooth enough for later, and end up leaving the lab with a lot less money. And so we're getting this very myopic looking behavior. Notice these are not myopic people. We know they're not myopic because they don't look myopic in any other condition, and they know they're Princeton students. But in a condition, in a setup, that makes scarcity such that you need something right now quickly, you might do something you would not have done had you had more time or more money. Here is an important point that's been really a, a remarkable discovery. Uh, this is from different studies, but it's all the same. Here is a classic performance you've now seen three or four times. The rich are not impacted by the chance to borrow high interest. The poor, it hurts them. Overall, the performance of the poor is much worse. Here is a remarkable fact. If you look at how the poor do during the rounds they play, so take a prince student who has very little time, they're time stressed. They run out of time too quickly, they feel they need to borrow, they borrow high interest and they, and they hurt the performance. During the rounds they played, they're more careful and more successful than the rich. They, in this particular game, this is a game where they have to aim, they aim more carefully, they take, they pay more attention, they do better. So they do better per moment played, but they run out of moments too quickly and end up hurting their performance. It's basically the notion, very much like we talked about the cabs, the, the poor does much better with her dollar than you do. She runs out of dollars way too quickly and pays a lot to get more, but the dollar is used better. We, when we enter the cabs and buy our things, there's a lot of work on shoppers coming out of supermarkets. We don't know how much we paid. We don't particularly care. We pay more for big packages and small ones. We don't even know it. The poor, they don't do that kind of thing. The idea that if you go into the supermarket here, a pound of tuna actually costs you more per unit than half a pound. It never occurred to you, and you do it all the time. Those big packages that surcharge you relative to the small ones don't get sold in poor neighborhoods because they check, and that's not a good deal. So they do a lot better with a dollar. Our students do a lot better with a second, but they run out of them too quickly. And the point here is that scarcity is just terribly distracting. It requires all your attention, and that's what you're focusing on. Uh, just to amuse you, here's one more. Another form of scarcity is, as mentioned, Sendel mentioned earlier, 
is dieting, you're constantly concerned, you're checking. We did a study where we played word search, so here are words, cake, tree, donut, cloud, etc. The odd number words are tempting foods, the even number words are just fillers, and you have to find the right word. And these are people in California playing for money. The control condition, notice, has the same even words, tree, cloud, la uh, lamp are all the same, but the food words have been replaced by other words. Now, you have to find these words, and what we're going to do now is look how long it takes you not to find the food words. We're going to look how long it takes you to find the irrelevant, the tree, the cloud, the lamp, which are identical in both. And what you find is that for the non-dieters, it doesn't matter what the other words are, the dieters take longer to find the word cloud when there's a donut on the page. <laughs> okay, so basically, it just grabs your attention and reduces your performance, and that has enormous implications, because you're thinking about the thing you're scarce on at the expense of what you're supposed to do now. We go to a mall in New Jersey, and we have, this is the following study, we go to shoppers in a mall, they agree to participate in the study, they sit in front of a computer, and they get financial scenarios that capture problems of the kinds that everybody occasionally has. So your car breaks down, it's going to cost X dollars to fix. How would you go about doing that? The car breaks down comes in two versions. Let's call it hard and easy. The hard problem, the car is going to cost you $1,500 to fix, which for many people in the mall today we know is a serious challenge. The easy problem, the car is going to cost you 150 while you're thinking how you're going to take care of this problem, we're going to let you play some games on the computer, and then you're going to tell us what you're going to do. And those games happen to be not just games, but very well-known cognitive psychological tools that we've used many times before, uh, many people have used. This is a cognitive control task. It has to do with pressing left versus right, depending on what you've seen. It's a classic divided attention test. Consider it a driving test. The better you do, the, the better your divided attention, the better is your focus. And the other is a classic thing all of you have seen, you might not remember. It's, it's the most dominant feature of an IQ test. It's the Raven's matrices, what's shape missing here. It's the most central component of most modern IQ tests. So while you're thinking about how you're going to fix the car, you're going to take these divided attention and IQ tests, and then you're going to give us the answer. And all this is cross. We get people's annual reported income, so we know who is rich and who is poor, which we define by, by a median split of the people in the mall. Okay, let's look at cognitive control, how well you drive. For the rich in the mall, whether they're solving the easy or the expensive car has no impact on how well they do when they drive. The poor in the mall, when the car is cheap, look indistinguishable from the rich, but when the poor are thinking how they're gonna take care of the expensive car, their divided attention is significantly lower. They, they drive less well. Raven's matrices, the rich, whether they're fixing the easy or the hard car, do equally well on the IQ test. The poor look just like the rich when the car is cheap to fix. When the car is expensive, they're less intelligent. This was done where they got uniform payment. Then, because of some colleagues in economics and others, we were convinced it would be nice to do this in a way where you're incentivized, where the better you do, the more pay you get. We replicated the whole thing. It's actually a bit stronger now. Basically what you get is that the people who are poor in the mall leave with less money from the experiment than those who are rich when the car is more expensive to fix. It's just distracting. You're thinking about it. It's not easy to resolve. It grabs your attention and you perform less well on everything from divided attention to intelligence. Uh, there are important differences between the rich and the poor. We had a wonderful opportunity where we can run this within subjects. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but these are sugarcane harvesters in India. These are farmers who harvest once a year. Because they harvest once a year, they, feel, they find it hard to smooth. They typically find themselves rich after the harvest and poor before. So we now run the same dudes four months apart and replicate some of the phenomena. They look poor and do less well on these cognitive tests before as opposed to after the harvest. Um, going back to one issue more that Sandal uh, mentioned that's important, what can we do about this? One issue that has come up before uh, that you saw through the Steele and Aronson work is the identity threat. One thing we know you can do to alleviate identity threat to some extent is an affirmation manipulation. You do something, for example, with the African-American kids that makes them feel better about their scholastic ability. When you do that, it's been done experimentally, they perform better. Uh, if you think about it, one of the identities that clearly are extremely stressful and threatening are being poor. In this case, we go to, uh, to the... Uh, Trenton area soup kitchen uh, in Trenton, 
and we assign people uh, randomly into an affirmation manipulation and a control condition. In the affirmation manipulation, for one minute, you speak into a tape, because a lot of them can't write, about a uh, recent issue that's make you, made you feel capable and proud. In the control, you don't do that. And then we give them a, simply the same test you've already seen. And again, they do better. They're, more, they're smarter and they're better in divided attention when they've just been affirmed than when they haven't. And in the final case, we also do a similar manipulation where on the way out, there's VITA side information and the ITC booklets, and we simply count how many of them take them. And after you've been affirmed, you're three times more likely to walk out with one of these packages than if you haven't been affirmed. Now, this is an important matter for discussion. Needless to say, when you pick up the package and leave with it, it doesn't mean you're going to apply. But at that moment, there is something that happens that impacts your behavior in pretty profound and important ways. Okay, um, there is an irony to poverty from all this. You're facing a more complicated and more tighter suitcase, a more complicated packing challenge, a much more complicated world in a much less friendly and helpful world where your errors are much more costly. There is a real irony here that's difficult to deal with. Going back to Sendel's um, initial design, through this work, which we didn't plan and sort of came upon us, we realized there's a, that one of the major bottlenecks is the psychic cost of poverty, just basically the resource of attentional resources and division of resources between what, the thing you're worried about now and plans for the future. There's a really deep way in which when I'm trying to figure out how to pay my rent this month, savings for retirement is not top of mind. In a deep, profound way, that's, that's exactly where we feel nudging and inventing and doing things that help with the current problem is a major issue. So the question came up earlier, until we can make the poor richer, which is obviously a better solution, until then, the question is what can we do to facilitate a life that's rife with psychic taxes that are very hard to control? And that's what we've come up with this, uh, we're piloting basically a financial stabilizer. And the idea is let's go all out and do all we can to make your daily life just a little bit easier. The defaults, the help, the financing, the smoothing of the financing, whatever you can do, to lower a bit the level of concern that you exhibit when you think how are you going to fix that expensive car in the mall, and will that help you, you know, drive better and, and be more intelligent at that moment when, you, when you're preoccupied? Uh, that's our agenda. Okay. Thank you. What's, what's brilliant about the intersection of economics and psychology is that it allows people who are more comfortable in the social sciences to still have faith and have um, uh, some compelling narrative about the fact that the human condition produces certain kind of behavior in certain circumstances and not have that um, uh, dismissed. You know, in more traditional economics or in a lot of uh, public policy conversations, the, the human element is kind of divorced from the, the, the proposals. And so what your work suggests is that if we don't start with people and we don't really understand what happens with real people, there is no solution to the problems that, what do we call it, the wicked problems or the most vexing problems. And so um, I take tremendous heart in seeing the intersection of two opposites. Uh, so the economics and the psychology, it just, cre it, you know, braiding it together gives us a much better, much more optimism about what's possible for people. So thank you. Our logo should be a black and white cookie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, just a quick response. I mean, thank you, that's wonderful. The one thing to keep in mind is back to Sendel's dart, dart example. So, you know, what we're not doing is going individual. You know, there are a lot of individual differences between us that are very important to where we are. Now, this entire story was still left at a very, call it cognitive level. We're still making assumptions that are true about all of us. And by doing that, every experiment you run, you'll get 60 to 70 percent, not everybody. And that's a deep issue that we have to learn to swallow. But having said that, I, I thank you, and I, and I agree. I think the, the one thing I'd add to what you said, which is, was for me very, very helpful, is I think a lot of problems that we try and solve uh, end up feeling unsolvable uh, because a lot of the solutions that we use and have been trying are not working. And I think that that 
that sort of, I always feel when I work on these things, that despondency is always just at the boundary of what you're thinking about. It's like, ah. Oh. But, you know, I'm now much more heartened by the fact that I think a lot of that is happening, just like in the 401k example, because we've just been pulling the wrong lever. We just haven't been thinking about what's going on in the person's mind. And so, of course, if we're going and educating or subsidizing, we're not getting results. It's not because the problem is unsolvable. It's just because we're pulling the wrong lever. Uh, I'm, I'm curious. Um, would you uh, help us understand how you are defining the poor? Hmm. And if we add to the conversation um, the, uh, a category now called the new poor, would the, would the, would the results or the, the behavior be the same or different? Can you help us sort out some of that? Uh, I think that uh, I'll give you the right answer. We're not defining the poor. And what I mean by that is in this work on the psychology of scarcity, poverty, as you can see, is a subjective phenomenon. So a farmer who lives on a dollar a day and has decided their needs are very meager and that's all they want in life, well, there isn't much of a gap between what that farmer wants and what they can accomplish. I'm not saying they're not objectively poor and we shouldn't be going out and doing things with them, like, like deworming, uh, as Dean was alluding to. But what's saying is the psychology of scarcity as we're working on it wouldn't apply to that person. Similarly, uh, a family of four living on $120,000 uh, who has a big mortgage and who has two cars that they don't want to see repossessed. So an outsider might look at them and say, why are they calling themselves poor? Well, we wouldn't say they're objectively poor, but they are experiencing the psychology of scarcity. That person, every bit as much as Eldar was saying, when they go to sleep at night, has thoughts of how will I make rent this month, or not rent, how will I make my mortgage this month? That person is cognitively loaded when they're at work. So that is so, I don't know if that helps you or, or it doesn't answer your question, but that ultimately, this is not an objective, this is not a sociological exercise to objectively decide what's poverty. This is a personal exercise to figure out how does someone who feels their ends don't meet, how is that happening? Um, and that's what determines the psychology. That doesn't mean that's what determines the outcome. Obviously, somebody living in the Bronx has other things in the world that operate on them that are different. But the mind, as it's experienced, is, is similar. And, and a corollary of that, by the way, just to f finish that thought, and I think that's what you may have been wanting to, or you're alluding to, is that if we take that subjective feeling seriously, clearly, and I meant to make a point of this, and I didn't, a lot of the work we just saw is not about the poor as defined by the poverty line. It's about those who have a very hard time finishing the month, and it may very well be for half of America today. And so in that sense, the psychology of being worried about how I'm going to you know, fit my suitcase does not require you to be officially poor. It requires you not to have enough to meet your needs and wants, which for many Americans today are not easily met. I'm Doug Bauer, and I'm with the Clark Foundation and an adjunct professor here at the B School in the Social Enterprise Program. What's interesting to me is you talk about poverty as a subjective phenomenon. Then how do you measure impact? Because uh, I think a lot of people in the private funding community uh, pay attention to impact and outcomes on the question of poverty in this city. Certainly the Bloomberg administration has made that very clear in their work in health and human services. So when you're thinking about this intersection between psychology and economics as it relates to people in poverty, then uh, and understanding it's irrational human behavior that drives some of these decisions. How do you then, I guess, extrapolate or make the jump to try and measure this stuff uh, so that we can, as we think about executing programs or funding programs, can pick the right programs to fund that will have the impact you're hope positive impact you're hoping to have uh, so and help people out of poverty? I think that's right. We would draw the distinction between science and engineering. Okay. So my answer about subjective poverty was a scientific answer. That's why I said it's, quote, the right answer. But it's not the right answer for another question. To be honest, if you told me that there are people on the Upper West Side who are now experiencing financial distress and showing all of this, I'm not going to say let's go in and have an aid program for them. I'm not going to say that because from an engineering point of view, it's not obvious that's where the social return is very high. So I would say the question you're asking I think applies much more to the engineering. So if we take these insights and we talk about the stabilizer package Eldar is talking about later, 
the way we'd measure impact there is very clear. We would say, okay, we are, and this is what we're doing, we are working with some employers, and if you know employers who'd be interested, please let us know. We have a few signed up, but more would be great. We would then implement this package with some of their employees, and what would we measure? We'd measure the proximate things the employer cares about, productivity. So we'd see does the package monetize itself and how much monetizing are we getting just from the productivity impact. If we get more than 100%, that'd be great. Employers will want to pay for it. But even if we get to 80%, that means 80% of the package is being subsidized by the employee worker gain. Then we would measure other more uh, financial benefits. How much is the employee saving in terms of late fees, et cetera, et cetera. Those are dollars we can add in. Where it gets messier is we then want to start this, these results suggest that these benefits, that when we measure these impacts, we shouldn't stop there. If this person is truly now less cognitively loaded, they'll be better parents. They'll be more likely to show up to their Head Start parent-teacher meetings on time. They will, there's a lot or even show up. So we would then measure those more diffuse impacts. Now, if we want to add all that up, it's that diffuse impact that then gets hard, but that's a standard problem in any sort of impact evaluation. But if you, if you load that all back in, then we'd say what we have is for this type of population, low-income workers, a product that has this bang for the buck. And, of course, it's up to funders to decide whether that's interesting, that population is interesting to them. Do we call? Oh. Hi. I'm sorry. Okay. Go for it. My name is Bonnie Stone, and I run an organization called Women in Need. Um, and we run family shelters across the city, uh, homeless shelters. And one of the main arguments of social policy is whether supply creates demand. And I wonder if you – and it's a very big subject – and uh, I wonder if, you, if you've addressed any of that, if you have any views on that. I would love to hear your, your views on that. Uh, I'll defer the economist to supply and demand. Supply and demand? <laughs> Look, I mean, it's obviously the case that supply does create demand. If I put out free donuts for a seminar, I'll get more people to come to the seminar. Um, but I think your intuition is right in the following sense, and that's where a lot of this work applies, is – there's a the problem you're describing you may want to call moral hazard it's like oh look if we create a big safety net more people will want to jump off and fall into it um, by the way I don't know if any of you have tried trapeze I tried it the other day and you don't want to fall into the safety net um, but I think what's wrong with that model and as Eldar was putting it is it presumes that the decisions that are being made are some long range cost benefit calculus but in fact, if you look at most of the behaviors that people uh, that we're trying to resolve, the safety net that we're trying to put in, those outcomes are not good for the person themselves. Like they wouldn't end up there on their own. I'll give you my most extreme example of this. There's arguments made in economics textbooks that if you uh, provide certain types of insurance for people who ride motorcycles, it'll encourage them to like Stop wearing helmets. Now, wearing a helmet is a very sensible thing to do just for yourself, even if there's no safety net. So the guy who's not wearing a helmet hasn't gone through all the calculus of saying, hey, this is a good idea, because if he had, he would have decided it's a bad idea. So the person who's not wearing the helmet is a person who hasn't done that cost-benefit calculation or something else was impeding it. Similarly, if you think of a payday loan, or any of these other products, it's not that the person ends up on the payday loan, taking a payday loan through some reason calculus that, hey, I can pay off, et cetera, et cetera, and then if there's therefore a big program at the end that has some um, renegotiation of debt, they take that into account. They're not thinking about that. They're thinking about, I need money right now. So I don't know if it's making sense, but zooming back to your program, the point is most of the safety net, most of those consequences are ensuring things that are falling outside of the tunnel. They're not the things that are being thought about when making choice. So they're not the things that are going to influence the choice. Does that make sense to you guys? Let me give a, let me give a very concrete example. Most homeowners, when they are buying a home and taking a mortgage, low-income homeowners are not thinking about, when I enter financial distress on this mortgage, how good is the renegotiation program that's available? Given that they're not thinking about that at the time that they're taking the mortgage, having that in place couldn't influence that behavior. And I think that's the big divide in many cases where we think the safety net creates supply, but in fact it's unlikely to. 
Uh, Joanne Page, I'm the CEO of the Fortune Society. We work with men and women coming out of prison. Uh, this was really good, and I found it just fascinating. And I just want to note two things. One is, for me, there was a paradigm shift in advocacy that you offered, and that was the parallel to scarcity of time and scarcity of money. Because the whole welfare queen conversation and the stigma attached to poverty deflates when you're talking to people who are suffering from time scarcity. So I think it's a powerful tool and worth using. The second thing is that you know, I work in the criminal justice field and the concept of deterrence, tying it to your motorcycle helmet analogy, has a lot to do with whether you believe there's a future. If you don't believe you have a future, deterrence simply doesn't work. If you expect to end up dead or in prison, you may as well get what you can get right now because you don't know that there's a future. And I think that there is a way in which that concept of hope and future ties into ability to do long distance planning that I think is really important. Uh, I just to say to you, thank you. And in the time we call the, uh, the uh, parallel to time our empathy bridge. And that's exactly the idea that it, it all of a sudden makes a lot of sense. Things that looked idiotic a minute ago all of a sudden start making a lot more sense. And there are things that happen to us that we don't know that we will review hopefully in, in the book. But it, there is amazing research, for example, on air traffic controllers. We, it's true about everybody, but you use them because you can actually objectively measure what kind of day they had. But if you have people sitting in your home for a few weeks engaging family interaction, uh, air traffic controllers after a hard day are less nice parents. They attend to their kids less, they read with them less, they spend less time at, in listening to what they have to tell. And on easy days, those same art of controllers are easier, are, are better parents. Now, you know, the idea here is that if you're focused on a very complicated scarcity problem, you're, you know, you're keeping a lot of planes in the air. You're, you're just having a harder day. And so there are a lot of very interesting implications that come from time, not just as a parallel to money scarcity, but also in terms of time scarcity for us and the poor. And, and so that's also, I think, a little bit relates to the supply and demand in a sense, because part of the supply here is not cash transfers. It's making your life just a little bit more manageable in ways that only benefit you to the extent that you're looking for something you're not doing well. It's a much, it's a different type of benefit. You want to talk about the penalty, the criminal justice system? You know, there's a lot of work on, on, on deterring crime in general, and the standard model says that the deterrence is a, is a product of the chance of being caught and the severity of the penalty. And most research shows that the severity of the penalty makes very little difference, because like you say, I'm worried about now, not then. But now the chance of being caught does make a difference. Having cops in the corner really reduces it in ways that, you know, making it all life sentence doesn't. But that, yeah, it's a... And, and I know you were talking about hope and broadening the horizon, <clears throat> but there's also something else one can do, and actually I think this, this hope experiment did that, and, um, is that to some extent if you want penalties to have impact, these long-run, diffuse, you might be caught big penalties are the worst thing you can have. Very immediate, small, they don't even need to be that consequential, but immediate consequential things for certain deviations can have enormously disproportionate impact. Exactly for the opposite reason that you're tunneling. That is, when you're tunneling, stuff outside may not matter much, but when you're tunneling, everything inside is disproportionately impactful. That doesn't mean that that is to say, and so in some sense, I think a lot of our system is built very differently. It's built with oh, you get a warning for missing a meeting, and then you get this, and it's sort of not much, and then a big thing at the end, which is exactly the wrong kind of thing to somebody who's focused on the tunneling. And that's what that, the GPS device, one feature of that. I think uh, there's been a theme between the past two comments uh, that you've made uh, regarding uh, the, the challenge involved in solving big problems, hard problems, um, and uh, not seeing them work or not seeing them work within a time frame that we're willing to tolerate. Um, and the uh, path forward, we, we talked a little bit about the difference between moving somebody past the poverty line versus getting into self sufficiency a much bigger chasm uh, to be filled there. Uh, and I'm curious about whether your research can lead to um, a way to value the, uh, the marginal contribution of additional disposable income for each unit of additional space in, in the suitcase 
that a low-income family has, what contribution uh, does that make in, on a psychic basis as the opposite of a psychic tax to the uh, pathologies uh, part of poverty that you were talking about before in terms of substance abuse or other types of pathologies that, that add to the negative dimensions of what poverty is? I mean, I think the valuing part we maybe since Ray has like really been glaring at me, maybe I'll, we'll try and make this brief. But let me let me answer the, the one thing I learned in Washington is to answer the question you you want to answer, not the one that was asked. So let me ask the question that I wanted you to ask. <laughs> you, your disposable income concept is, I think, when you look at scarcity, that's how you normally think about it. You you assume the only way out of this is to create more disposable income. In fact. That's actually uh, misleading. And let me explain what I mean. Most poor, uh, nearly all low-income individuals in, uh, in the U.S. have a savings rate of about 10%, which may surprise you because it's not true, but it's sort of true. Here's how it's not true. They are not saving 10% a year. Here's how it's very true. If you look at their income, take out their consumption, what's left over, easily 10%. Where does that money go? It goes to late fees and interest payments. If you're constantly paying your bills late and you're borrowing to pay them, that is 10%. You're, not, you're actually consuming 10% less. It's because you're one step behind. Get that person one step ahead, you've created 10% disposable income. You don't need to increase income. You just need to get them one step ahead. That is paying every bill late a couple of months late or paying reconnect charges or paying it a couple of months early. It's still the same bill except minus 10%. And so that's the insight of that stabilizer package I was describing to you was that money that's going to late fees, you can actually recapture. It's not, you don't, I mean, increasing income is terrific, but you can actually get a lot of disposable income just by getting people off of a debt cycle and onto a pay ahead cycle. So if you do that right. Thank you very much.